Mark Whipple is founder and president of Pinnacle Strategies. He studies and writes on the topic of execution performance, having written four books and penned many white papers and ebooks on process improvement and project execution. With extensive experience in oil and gas, consumer products, IT, automotive, along with many manufacturing industries, Mark is a highly sought after subject matter expert. Industry leaders such as Shell Oil, FMC Technology, Spear Aerosystems, Wilson Art International, Applied Microcircuits have all worked with Mark to improve their process and delivery capabilities. So Mark, the floor is yours. Good day, thanks for coming. Um, Jennifer, uh, could you start my video please? So they can see my face anyway. Uh, that Yes indeed, this is a live, uh, a live webinar. Uh, as Jennifer said, I, I felt a little bit like she was reading my resume. And, uh, uh, you know, I've got this uh, question and answer pane started, um, uh, shows up on my desktop, not yours. Uh, but, um, you know, if you ask a question, I'll see it. I might get, I might get, uh, I might stop in the middle and, and answer your questions. So let's get started. So, you know, everyone, you don't see it's coming until it's too late. Everything was green until it wasn't. Uh, all the parts of your project were close to being on time, at least until they weren't. Uh, if you if you had known earlier, you might have been able to do something, but of course um, you don't, and so now you have to spend a lot of money and um, to catch up and you have to deal with the customer problems and everything and that light at the end of the tunnel well that's definitely a train so what to do you know most project managers and executives uh, assume that since the schedule showed the project was on time it must have had a bad schedule um, and if only we had planned better we could have finished on time and there's some truth to that but not as much as you think you know, the thing is that projects are not abstract things lived out in spreadsheets and software, and there's really no such thing as a perfect plan or a 100% accurate forecast. I mean, after all, how well can we predict the weather? Uncertainty is what makes a project a project. Uh, projects are inherently uncertain, and when we start them, we know lots of things that we'll encounter on the way to completion of the project, but we don't know everything. That means that surprises are a way of life in the project world. And any plan that, uh, that we put together is going to be made up of educated guesses. And Jennifer, I'm still trying to get this video going and I can't make it work. So you're the host. You have to start it. Now, experienced project managers recognize this and develop coping strategies to deal with this uncertainty. I mean, I think that nobody, nobody, everybody knows that projects are uncertain and that's why we have all of these things. We have, we develop skills for negotiation so we can get more resources. Um, we can add contingency to the schedule and we find creative ways to disguise it. Um, we have stakeholder management processes, risk management processes. Um, we try to make the plan better, make, more detail, uh, do frequent replanning. All of these things um, we can do, but they really um, don't address the core of the of the issue of uncertainty. The fact that um, there that surprises will have happen, and that uncertainty is what makes precise planning impossible. So no matter how good you are at planning. Sorry, I'm uh, still messing with my video and it's not working. So no matter how good you are at planning, um, you're not going to have anything that's perfect. You can have uh, a good schedule, but you're not going to have a perfect schedule. And this is why we say that improving your planning process is not where you're going to find your biggest opportunity, particularly when you're behind. Where you're going to find your biggest opportunity is during execution. You have to be nimble. And if you're not nimble during execution, then your great plan that you've done won't matter anyway. 
So how do you quantify your nimbleness and how do you pull out of a bad situation? That's what I'm going to talk about for the next, I don't know, oh, 50 minutes or so. Um, so let's, first of all, let's look at the early warning signs. Um, you know, we're not going to look at the plan first uh, because uh, we operate under the press. Um, we, <laughs> the plan doesn't really matter because all plans are bad. So what we want to look at first is um, how we're managing the project. So project planning is a bit like time travel and, you know, who knows what you're going to find there. So rather than be the best forecaster, we'll build the best time machine. Um, and that process is the best predictor of your project success. So while I can find opportunity in every plan, I, I used to be a project scheduler. Um, you know, I started my career as a scheduler, so I know actually quite a bit about it, but that's really not where you're going to get the big opportunity. Uh, what I'm going to do first, what I suggest you do first is look at what the project team is doing. How are they managing? How flexible are they? How responsive are they? Now, there are behavioral indicators that tell that can tell you whether your project will be on time aside from the schedule. So, uh, these behavioral indicators can be measured, they can be quantified, they can be improved. Uh, the project execution maturity model has 12 elements, but I'm only going to give you five. Here's five things that I think define what the core of a nimble team is. First, your team is focusing on the future. They're talking about what is to be done, not what has to be done. Second, one team, one goal, functional objectives of the, of the team members are subordinated to the project objectives. Three, the task priorities in the project are stable, they're not shifting back and forth day to day. So resources are able to work on the, each project task until they're completed. Um, um, functional objectives, oops, I went the wrong way. Um, the project teams know where to get leverage in the project. They know where the bottlenecks are. They're clearly identified. They're clearly communicated. And the team is responding rapidly. So the question is, let's look at your team, all right? So this is just for fun. Uh, we're going to do a little, a little survey here in a minute. So look at your team. Think about your team. Are they living in the past? Uh, in a lot of projects, reporting progress is a substitute for moving forward. And while it's true that you have to understand where you are relative to where you're going, uh, reporting completions is not a substitute for managing the future. So if your team is living in the past, they'll be spending a lot of time reporting progress, percent complete, or and or giving the reasons why things haven't gotten worked out the way they were supposed to. And they're spending a lot of time working to understand where they are. Um, project meetings are spent sorting out what has been done and negotiating priorities. That The team is just the entire conversation of the team is what has happened, not what will happen. Now, secondly, you see the goals of the team members are not lined up. Many times, the only person who's actually on the project is the project manager. Um, he has to then spend his time on the task of enrollment um, and uh, rather than and focusing on moving the project forward. So frequently, uh, it happened. this happens so frequently that there's a, a, bot, a section in the PMBOK based on, um, on stakeholder management. So it seems like our project team members are two-faced, right? They're, uh, when they show up at the project, they're one way. When they go back to their functional area, they're another. And if any team member has a conflicting goal, then what you're going to see is a lack of engagement. They're not going to be fully engaged. They might not make decisions that make, they might, they might even make decisions that make completing the project more difficult. They don't respond to questions. Uh, they don't come to meetings. Um, they're not collaborating with the rest of the team. So here's the thing. In order to win, everybody has to be on the same goal. So for example, you know, if you've got, um, Typically, what we have is we've got somebody that's responsible for the budget, 
so they're going to come to the project team with a financial mindset and everything that the project does is going to be about the budget. You're going to have the product developers or the project man, the product managers and everything that they do is going to be about the customer experience and you're going to have the supply chain people and everything that they come to is going to be about, um, you know, the, the price and trying to get the price down and dealing with the suppliers. The idea here is that, um, you have to have one team. Now, think about your team for a minute, all right? And uh, Jennifer is going to give a poll here, I think. Um, which one of these statements reflects your team? So go ahead and answer these, and I want you to score them, all right? Just uh, take a piece of paper out or something and write down how many points. I'm going to ask you about four or five of these questions. The video is working. How are we doing? Has everybody uh, responded? I'll leave it up for a few more seconds. Looks like we okay. have a couple more people who still need to vote. All right, I will go ahead and end the poll. Just a couple more seconds for any last minute people. KPIs, whatever the KPIs are, all right, whatever the KPIs, the KPIs are, uh, whatever you, the project team has decided that they would be. Okay, so everybody is uh, over there in the, that's pretty interesting. 100% has answered over here that team members. Okay, good. Let's move on to the next one. So everybody put yourself down for two points and let's go to the next one. So thinking about your project team again. Are the task priorities changing often? Now, when what you'll see here is that the project team members are going to spend their time sorting through the work to determine which tasks um, should have the highest priority. They'll be responding to um, the latest um, communication from a customer or a coworker or a boss, and they'll be switching, uh, changing priorities for, um, for tasks, changing priorities for resources, many times not finishing things before they can start another. And of course, they'll be complaining, uh, coming, the complaints will come back, I can never finish anything, can't you guys can't make up your mind, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you know, all of that is a sign of multitasking and um, when multitasking, when you're multitasking, you're introducing more work into the system, which delays the project. So uh, for an example, we had, uh, uh, we worked with a, a team in Norway that um, was developing software. They were actually, it was a, they were supporting software for their main product for geolocation for ships. And what the software did is it um, told the ship where it was and then it controlled all the control systems so the ship could stay stationary in a spot in the middle of the ocean. Well, uh, the problem when we arrived was that, you know, they couldn't get their, um, uh, they, they couldn't get the new features out. New features were, were never coming out and it seemed like the guys were busy, but nothing was ever coming out. Nothing was getting updated. And uh, we came to find out that um, they had, priorities coming from um, their boss. They had priorities coming from their customer, customer priorities coming from um, their uh, product development team. And they had actually priorities coming from ship captains. So somehow these ship captains in the middle of the ocean would found the name of a developer and would ring up a developer in Norway, right? So they're in the middle of, you know, the Arctic Sea, the Arctic or the Mediterranean or wherever the heck they are. And they're phoning up some developer in, in Norway. And of course, these guys, you know, they're very customer sensitive and they're like, oh my gosh, the customer's got a problem. They would be dropping what they were doing. And of course, made it very difficult to figure out, you know, 
made it very difficult to predict when things were going on. And, and of course, nothing ever happened. So think about your team. So we're getting a poll, all right? So score yourself the same way here. Go ahead and I was told not to read these answers, these uh, because uh, they're not necessary. But uh, I have the questions up. If uh, if you've got a quick question, any of you? I'll go ahead and leave the poll up for just a few more seconds, see if anyone else wants to vote. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now. Ha, huh. okay. <laughs> Interesting. Everybody is answering the same way. You guys are in the right presentation for sure. Um, great. Let's move on. Next. Is your team chasing bottlenecks all the time? And uh, so some of you are not in the U.S. This uh, this fellow here is playing a game called Whack-A-Mole, and every he's got the hammer, and every time one of those moles pop up out of the uh, out of one of those holes he has to hit it with the hammer and uh, the, the faster you are the more points that you get um, and if you're chasing bottlenecks all the time your project probably feels like a game of whack-a-mole uh, the project never has enough resources to complete the work at hand uh, there's never enough time it just seems like the right resources are not available when you need them they might have been available last week maybe they would be available in two weeks but they're just not available now you, there's always a constraint that is going to limit the, pro, the rate at which a prog project can be completed. But if, if it's always moving from week to week or day to day, it indicates that your team really doesn't understand um, where they can get their leverage on their projects. So the bottleneck is where you're going to get that leverage. And if you don't recognize it, then you're going to be just spinning your wheels. You're going to be playing whack-a-mole. So we did a project um, uh, last year where, uh, a big complex project and you know when we showed up it was the it was one of the suppliers of a engineered component and then it was the forging supplier to the supplier and then it was the quality guys and then it was the engineers because there was some kind of a problem and then it was the welders and then it was final assembly um, then it was construction so for, for a period of about Oh, I don't know. I want to say eight weeks or so, you know, the, it was bouncing around because the team was constantly chasing it. They're constantly reacting to where the problem is. And there was very little anticipation. It just seemed like, you know, a new project meeting, new problem. So how well are your team members? How well is your team managing your bottlenecks? Wow. Good job there, Jennifer. Bam. About 30 more seconds for anyone else to vote. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results. All right. So again, 100%. All right. Slow response to problems. Lots of projects, many projects, you know, that, that I've worked in 
are had this problem of the the favorite excuse is I sent an email, uh, but I haven't gotten a response. Uh, and yes, there the different time zones can create a delay if you're in the U.S. and your people are in China or something. Um, but we get and yes, we get hundreds of emails a day. But a delayed response to a critical problem slows the entire project down. So a slow response to problem indicates that a team is not fully engaged with your project. Um, they don't understand what the important issues are or who owns them. Sometimes, uh, you know, we don't even know who that person is. Who, it takes, you know, a week to find out who's the guy or who's the girl that is owning that problem that has to fix that problem. Um, and if you think about it, the single largest aspect of your project duration is not going to be the time that's spent actually working. It's going to be spent waiting. So the more waiting, the longer your project. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's no line item in your project plan for wait for an answer. So how well is your team responding? And by the way, I can't see who's, who's, who's saying yes and who's saying no to these things. All I get is a number that says, here's the numbers. And I can't vote. About 30 more seconds for anyone else to vote. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results. Okay, so you guys do a little bit better at responding um, than you did in the other ones. Good. All right, let's move on to the scoring. Now, look, what I want you to do is I want you to add up all your score. All right, add up the, the point values for all your questions. All right, so you see the point values there. Take a second and do that. All right, and uh, add them all up. Um, so if your score is less than six, uh, you, you're going to be late. There's your, your, uh, my guess is that if your score is less than six, this is something that you're dealing with all the time. Um, if your score is between six and 11, seven and 11, um, you're probably going to be late, but you might be able to pull it out at the last minute. And if you are delivering on time, it's because of uh, the last minute heroics, lots of expediting, that sort of thing. Um, if your score is greater than 11, up to about 16, you've got a pretty good chance of finishing on time. Uh, but you could still be bitten because uh, there are some elements that are missing. And um, if your score is uh, 17 or greater, you're in great shape. And uh, I suspect that none of you got that score. So. What do we do? All right. So when our project is in trouble, uh, you really have two things that you have to do. One is you have to stop losing time. And the other is you have to regain that lost time. Um, mo most projects have a date. There's a date associated with it. So let's deal with it. What I'm going to do in the presentation for the balance of the presentation is I'm going to deal with those two items. So let's talk about the first one, stop losing time. And when we think about uh, stop, how do we stop losing time, it's dealing with these problems that I just went through. All right. We're, the team is looking forward. We have one team, one goal. We're controlling our priority priorities and we're leveraging our bottlenecks and all of that will send us or will enable us to respond quickly. So let's deal with the first one. How do we get people to look forward? The first thing that we want to do is we want to visualize the process. So this is a VPB or a, 
a visual project or and actually this is a visual portfolio board uh, this has each one of those squares represents a project um, so this particular one is a is a portfolio board but uh, and I'm and we use a lot of boards because what it does is, is it helps visualize the process right and when you visualize the process the team has a big advantage all right they can see where they are where they're going the the major obstacles to moving ahead uh, it prevents information over overload so the team can see exactly where they are all the time it gives a, a tangible feedback so everyone can see it everyone can understand it uh, if there's a bottleneck or a gap uh, there isn't a big discussion no, well is that a real problem or not um, the entire team can see that there's a problem um, it's obvious right now it it solves it solves part of the living in the past problem an important part of it because it's pointing the way towards where the project should go so by definition uh, in this particular uh, um, uh, board it moves from left to right now that I think about it, all of them we do everything moves from left to right and so you can see that uh, that gold project there in the middle that's that's in really good shape and uh, but there's a whole bunch of work right there <coughs> so this is one way to do it another way to do it is like this with post-it notes I mean you know this is just hand-drawn post-it notes hand lettered uh, each of the colors mean different things but the point here that I'm trying to make is not how to teach you make a board that's we don't have time for that but what I want to do is I want to make sure that you understand that presenting your project visually where all the work in the system where is it um, and who does it belong to is an important part of creating that environment where the team can look forward and work forward so once we've built that process then we can or once we have built that visualization then we can start to engage people so if you think about the board the board is like your playing field it's just the or if it's if you're playing monopoly it's just the board of the the game happens around the board but the board the uh, but without the board you can't play the game so this is what we do the the collaboration process then is the the rules on how we use the board so that the, a nimble team has to be communicating the right information to the right person there can't be a disagreement about the status um, that sort of thing all right so the VPB is the way that we can see everyone can see the field of play all right now I'm gonna give you I think about six different things that you can do to build your collaboration process first of all Make sure that you meet face to face 15 minutes at least once a week at the board. All right. One, we meet face to face so we can create accountability. All right. So I have to look somebody in the eye. Okay. I can't hide behind an email. I can't hide behind a phone. Um, I want to do it weekly because weekly is going to be setting up the tempo of my completion. So at least weekly, some projects we uh, we worked in we've done it daily some twice a week um, but I want to do it every at least once a week so everybody is synced up everybody knows what the action plan is for the following week and we do it for 15 minutes to keep the meeting short and we stand up so you see everybody's even there's even though there are chairs in this room they're standing up and uh, the idea is that the the meeting has, is very purposeful, so we're not spending a lot of time doing analysis. We're spending time on figuring out on what we do. So we stand up to keep the meeting short. Now, in that meeting, what are we doing? We're focusing on what is to be done, not what has been done. So that means that if there's a problem, it gets handled offline. Status updates, handled offline what happens in that meeting is who's going to do it how are we going to how are we going to engage each other to do that and that and that's the end of that discussion sometimes there's a discussion is this more important than this what's the priority that sort of thing and that's all game but um, history is for analysis not for collaborative execution so a third rule 
Um, and this goes not just for the, this, this is not for the meeting, but this is just for building your collaboration process. And you, what you want to do is you want to limit the time that you wait for answers. So uh, a useful rule is 24 hours. It, nobody waits more than 24 hours for an answer for a project query. So if you get a, if you're on a project team, you get an email from somebody else, then no more than 24 hour response. If you're out of town, you delegate, you know, we do not want to wait. So that doesn't, you know, ideally we want to give an instant response, but of course that's not a practical. Um, I, we've set 24 hours as, as a rule. Uh, and that seems to work okay. Uh, so what that does is that limits how much time any, anybody will wait, right? So what you've done is you set up at least a, a stop on that. And of course, it builds accountability too, right? So uh, we build an agreement among our team that I'm going to respond to you. I'm going to respond to you. You, I can, I can figure out where my camera is. I'm going to respond to you in 24 hours or less, right? And if I don't, then I know that you're going to come and challenge me on that. Um, make sure every task has a person associated with it. So tasks uh, are not done by departments. They're not done by suppliers. They're not done by functions. They're done by a person. So everybody owns a task on that. So um, this eliminates the ambiguity, create transparency in the project, and builds accountability for getting the work done. Now, uh, this is also important. Who gets to change the project? Now, a lot of projects have a formal scope change process going on, but there's still a lot of changes that happen in the project. And when I'm talking about changing the project, I'm talking about any dimension of the project, the budget, the uh, scope, the design, um, the sequence, um, the content of the work. Somebody on the team is going to be responsible for controlling that. All right. Now that doesn't mean that they make the final decision, but they coordinate that change. So we don't have change coming uh, 16 different directions. We have change coming from one direction. All right. And related to that is priority control. So uh, in the example that I used uh, about the ship captains calling the, um, the, the coders, all they did is they did two things. They built an FAQ website so people could go to the website and they could get whatever questions so they didn't have to bother a developer. And the other thing is that they uh, all phone, all, all outside calls went through a central person who would then, if it was a customer, would then work that into the priorities. So all the priorities for the, for the unit came through one person. And again, what we're looking for is we're not looking for reasons to say no to our customers. What we are doing is we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say yes as often as we can without destroying the entire project or projects. Lastly, make sure that you have a way to manage conflict because there are going to be conflicts. There's going to be two customers that are going to be want the same resource. There's going to be two managers that want the opposite things. This is just a fact of life. So make sure that you have a process in place where you can uh, escalate or you can go to a final authority to say, okay, I've got this and each person can make the say it and make that case and then that decision can be made in an organized way. Because one of the things that we see is that when there's a conflict or people disagree, um, there's no action. Uh, they, they just get stuck. So we have to understand that if we're going to collaborate, there has to be a process of uh, moving ahead. So the game doesn't stop just because you and I don't agree. All right. So those are the things that some of the things that you can do on the collaboration process. Now, uh, one team, one goal. So we've got everybody collaborating. We're all in the same room. We visualize the project. Now, how do we over? How do we get everybody to play together nicely? Now, if you think about, you know, the game analogy or a sports analogy that a single scoreboard, a single set of scores um, goes a long way to creating the right kinds of behaviors that we want in our project team, all right? So measure, we use measurements as a way to create that um, one team, one goal. And, so here's a couple of them. These are just not everything that we've done, not, but these are, the I think, the most important one, right? What do we want people to do? We want people to work faster. 
All right, so what we do is we measure the speed of task completions. How frequently do we complete our task completions? Um, we're not looking at on-time delivery. We just want people to work as fast as they can at, at good quality. So we measure, are we getting faster? Um, we also want the team members to solve problems, all right? So in other words, we want to know, are, is problem solving going on? Are we solving problems? So we measure two different things. We measure one, uh, the red line, which is uh, tasks or projects that are stopped, all right? And a, stop, a project can get stopped because we're waiting for an answer for somebody, waiting on a supplier, whatever. Uh, whatever it is, pro progress has stopped. We have the yellow line for uh, items that are potentially a problem that somebody is looking at and say this could be a problem now what we want to see is we want to see that those that nothing stops and that that we're seeing things move along and the other thing we want to see is that people are proactively solving problems so our expectations is that the number of blockages to our project should decline during the life of the project, and we want to know, are we solving them early? So when we talk about solving them early, we're talking about measuring, uh, we don't want surprises. So we want transparency. Um, so what we do is we measure the tasks that, that uh, just suddenly turn red, or the number of tasks that went from yellow to green. Um, the point is that we want to see people solving problems early so we can measure that. Um, and of course, the other thing too, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see the average days to resolve. The other thing that you want to do is you want to see, are we getting better? Are we getting faster at resolving problems? And if you look in that column, you can see that we went from 21 to 17 to 10 to seven days. So in this particular uh, uh, project, um, they, uh, they were getting faster. So um, you think about your, your scoreboard. Your scoreboard, I mean, the, at the end of the day is, is uh, you know, did you win the game? All right, did you, fix, did you deliver the project on time? But during the game, you're also measuring all the different aspects of your execution. And these measurements are not necessarily, in fact, none of them are financial. I guess uh, some of the, you know, some measurements would be financial, the classic kinds of things of, you know, are we spending too much money and, you know, where are we in our budget and how much time is left in the schedule and all of that stuff we want to have here. But this is the basic execution behaviors that we want that we can observe, we can measure, and we can communicate. And so this is a great way to get people on the same team. Everybody knows this is the way we're measuring our success. When you have a single scoreboard, everybody knows what good looks like. Um, controlling priorities, next. All right, so everybody's working together. How do we control priorities? And um, I emphasize controlling priorities um, so significantly because of its impact on multitasking. And multitasking, as you know, if you've seen my videos, uh, multitasking is evil. Um, and so you want to make sure that you've got good control and multitasking is caused by, in, in my view, priority, a lack of priority management. We don't have good control of our priorities. All right. So when you think about establishing your priority management scheme, your priority management system, you want to say, okay, who gets to set them, right? On what conditions are they going to get to set it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we can say, you know, we want to have a consistent set across the organization. So we've got consistent priorities throughout the organization. Everybody's working on the same thing. It's a, if it's a delivery date, fine. If it's, um, if it's the um, project risk, fine. All right. It has to be in alignment with the business. All right. And it, most importantly is that the, the, your priority system has to be transparent. Right. It has to be obvious. Uh, there's, there can be any, any kind of uh, uh, ambiguity on how a priority is set. You know, we don't want people setting their own, all right? So um, in, in one example, it, was, it doesn't have to be complicated. Here's, here's an example that, where they had the projects with the highest priority were communicated by 
putting an arrow card or an arrow sticker on the card, big red arrow. All right. And um, every week, the top three priority projects would be flagged by the senior guy of the organization. So um, we, we were able to pull in, uh, if you think about this process, it gives the, the senior management the ability to drive and uh, their projects through some very simple mechanisms. And they were getting their priorities from their customer, right? So if you think about how this particular implementation went, it went from the customer to the director, the director to the, pro the portfolio manager, the portfolio manager to the project team, and then to the resources, all through a very simple uh, arrow stuck on a card, all right? Um, it doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to be transparent. So when you think about setting up your priority control system, you know, you don't have to think about, you know, doing buffer burn ratio and stuff like that. I mean, that's a good way to do it. But, you know, it, it's not important as long as it serves the organization, how complicated it is. Make it simple. Make a simple point of communication. All right. So make sure that, like I said earlier, you've got a single person who's controlling the priorities and when I say control, you know, they're not necessarily establishing, they're just controlling the communication of the priorities. And most importantly, have a plan for emergencies because customers are going to change their mind, things are going to go wrong. Um, make sure that you have a plan. Have a plan to change priorities, to work in emergencies at, without breaking the entire system. Now, leveraging the bottlenecks. Okay, so everybody's working on the right priorities. Everybody's working together. Now we can, you know, we can, now we've got essentially a good structure in place and now we can do the actual work of making the project go. And the first thing we want to be focusing on is where's the weakest link? Think about it. Resources are not infinite. Their availability is subject to both um, the volume and the timing, right? So you've got two dimensions of resource availability. And your project performance is going to be determined by how the, the project team lines that up. Now, similarly, uh, you think, so in this regard, a project is like a chain, right? The, the one at the end can't do any better if the one at the beginning is not doing well, right? So we have to find that weakest link, that weakest link we call the constraint. So... If you're visualizing the board, visualizing your process, you're going to see where that weakest link is. You're going to see, you know, the, the number one indicator for a, a bottleneck or constraint is going to be the pile of work that sit, is sitting there. So in this example, you can see uh, this is a, a little bit of a, I didn't, I didn't have another uh, actual board to show you, but um, you can see how all the cards are piled up there. All right. And so once the team sees it, they can say, all right, let's take some action, right? Uh, and the team should be then focusing on why is the work piled up here, right? Because, it, you know, this, this doesn't tell us why we have a constraint. It might be, you know, it might be that there's too much work lo loaded into the system. It just tells us where there's a problem. So the team then is engaged on doing the analysis on uh, and then developing strategies to break it and assigning, assigning people to do it. So if we're doing all of those things, then if we are looking forward, if we have one team, one goal, if we're controlling our priorities, if we're leveraging the bottlenecks, we will be responding quickly, all right? And we will stop losing time. Now, we might not be gaining time, so for gaining time, we have to do something else and we have to really dive into the process. So when we talk about recovering time, what we want to look for are the highest risks. And I say the highest risk is scheduled risk, all right? Um, get action on those risks and the communicate process or, or progress and get accountability. Now, this is a separate process that runs in parallel to the execution process. So the first step is where are those um, top focus areas? Then we do a deep dive. So we're, what neighborhood is, we do a deep dive. We find the part numbers, the suppliers, the manager, whatever. Um, we figure out why do we have that problem. We create an action plan. We execute the plan, and we communicate it back 
to the project team. So it's four, how many steps are there? Five steps. All right. So I'm going to go through them quickly. I don't have time to go through. I spent all my time on the hidden things and not a lot of time on this. This is probably a topic of another webinar, but let's, let me just talk through this. So the first part of identifying the top risks is, is really schedule integrity. You know, you want to find out if I'm going to regain time, I have to get out in front. I have to look at my plan. I have to look at my schedule and um, we'll test the integrity of the schedule. We're not going to do a complete replan because we're already late. We don't have time to do a replan. But what we do want to do is we want to test the integrity of the schedule. We want to things, look, look at the schedule and see, you know, look for the big things. Are, are we missing work? Do we have our resources allocated correctly? Uh, do the time estimates, are they way out of whack? Um, do we have the tasks linked up correctly? Do we have the sequences done? Um, the point here is not necessarily to find everything, but to find the big things. Then we can go into the do, do a deep dive and find the specific part numbers, the specific suppliers, the contractors, the department heads, the people who are accountable. Now, once we've done that, then we can prepare a response. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask that department head, that, that person responsible to develop an action plan. Uh, and that action plan can be a whole bunch of different things. It can be, you know, whatever, you know, the options are limitless in terms of what you can do to reduce their risk. When I say reduce risk, I'm talking about reduce schedule risk. And that means, you know, how can we make the, the tasks shorter? How can we eliminate tasks? How can we move something off the critical path? Um, you know, is there something else that we can do? Can we do alternatives? You know, those sorts of things. And then, we put it into plan, we put it into effect, uh, and then report it out to the team and to build accountability. Now, when we think about how these things work, you know, I, uh, I think in my other earlier writings, you know, I've said, well, the plan's not important and, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to retract that. I, I want to say that the, I, the plan is, is still important. It's just not as important as most people think that it is. Um, but this ties to uh, when we're being, uh, when uh, I, I, I missed part of my slide here. I'm sorry about that. So uh, the report out is as important as finding the focus area because one of the things that we want, we want to know is did it work? Did our, uh, were we able to actually do the implementation? Were we actually able to re revise the, or uh, resolve the risk, eliminate the risk? Um, and this is really where the team starts coming into play, right? Because this is where our execution process and our risk mitigation process start to get integrated. You know, at the beginning, when we're trying to find the focus areas, we're bringing that to the, to the uh, execution team uh, at the board and saying, well, these are the areas that we think are most important. And, you know, the team gets to decide, yes, that's something we need to do a deep dive on. And then when they co come back with the analysis, you know, we're looking at our, at our execution plan. If you think about what that board is, that's a representation of what's actually happening. And then when we do the report out, we're being accountable to our execution team. So we're closing the loop, the loop between planning and execution as we go along. So that's a really brief, brief uh, introduction. Now, typically what I tell people to do is to do these two processes in parallel, because if you think about regaining time, the stop losing time is going to be how well do, can we work together? Can we get action? Can we move ahead? And the regaining time is where you're going to be actually changing your process. So to stop losing time, you're going to find ways to work better within the process that you have. Regaining time is you're going to start changing your project. And typically, the regaining time is much more technical uh, in nature and is done um, by support staff and not necessarily uh, by um, uh, the, the execution team. So um, these are just some of the results. I mean, if you do it right, what you're going to see is a reduction in completion time. You're going to th see things go faster and you're going to get better productivity and you're going to have confidence. And a lot of times, 
many times. If you're behind schedule, uh, nobody has confidence in you. Nobody has confidence in your plan. And uh, you're just uh, a bad person. As simple as that. A uh, bad manager, and I don't believe anything that you say. And uh, by doing these things, what you can do is rebuild confidence. The customer gets confidence in you, management gets confidence in you, and you get confidence in yourself and your ability to plan the future. <laughs> Marius, I'm, I'm laughing at your joke. Yes. <laughs> um, so this is a timeline. Look, and stopping deceleration. You know, getting, stop losing time, get the process flow, develop your action plan on how you're going to, how you're going to um, implement your uh, execution process and build collaboration. That takes about, I've got, I've got about three weeks in here and that's usually about right. Uh, we've done it in less time. Actually, we've done it in, we've done it in a week. I've got it here in three weeks and then we start doing implementing uh, improvements, starting doing bottleness, bottleneck busting the next two weeks. And then um, we start to, it says facilitate the process, but this is more like stabilize the process and then hand it off. All right. Because a lot, I, and I have it up here because we're, we're, you know, we at Pinnacle Strategies, we're kind of like the firemen. So, you know, what we're trying to do is we'll get it set it up and running. And then we, st and our goal is to hand it off. And six weeks is about right. Um, we've done it in less time and we've done it in more time, but six weeks is a good number. And now, but the recovery process is a little bit different. Um, part of the problem or part of the, one of the reasons that it takes longer is this test, this testing the project plan. That's some deep analytical stuff. And depending on the size of the project, it's going to take some time to sort out, um, uh, you know, where all the pieces of the project are and then do a recalibration and doing the recalibration is almost, uh, is, is, is quite a painful, uh, uh, endeavor because you have to go back, you have to go back to managers and say, well, I know I told you it'd be done by February 3rd, but now it looks like it's going to be done in June. Uh, and then nobody, nobody likes having that conversation. Uh, but anyway, after we've done that, then we can start this process that I outlined earlier where we're identifying the risk, planning the recovery actions, and, and working in that and working in these cycles. Now, um, when we've done it, um, when we've done this, uh, this is, uh, I've got the typical, all right, so you can see um, the, uh, the line there is the critical streams of work. And um, so this, this relates to a a very large project um, that involved hundreds and hundreds of people, and uh, it was a big it was a big project. Um, and you could see that when we when we came in, our first blush at the schedule, there were twenty four critical streams of work. You know, now out of how many streams of work? I think twenty four out of twenty four uh, were actually were actually critical. So everything on the thing was critical. So we did the recalibration, and you can see that it went to zero. So we recalibrated the schedule. We put up a new due date. Everybody said, yes, this is a new due, date, new due date. And then time started going on. And you start to see the critical streams starting to rise. And then you see the good thing. You start to see it stabilizing. All right? And the fact that it stabilized meant that things were, going, things were solved, getting found, solved, found, solved, found, solved, found, solved. So this was the, um, our experience uh, in one project. And, um, I don't know if we've got anybody from uh, 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 from the project that's on this uh, on this uh, uh, webinar, but these are just you know a couple of things that uh, our guy said. Now, what do you need to do? All right, uh, I can't teach you everything, but I want to let you know that there is a couple of things coming out. All right, one is there's a lean project management course with Critical Chain. Uh, if you're looking to build consensus for a new approach to project execution, this is going to be the workshop. This is going to be the how do we do the deep dive? How do we assess our our um, our system? What are the principles? Why is multitasking bad? This is going to be um, about why, and that's going to be in Dallas uh, in a couple of weeks, and then San Diego and Boulder. I'm trying to pick the nice parts of, of the U.S., um, but if you are if if you don't want to get into a lot of theory and you just say, "Okay, I want to start right now," 
then what you should do is you should go to this class, the Streamlining Project Execution with Visual Project Management. And this is more of a lab and uh, where we spend maybe a day going through concepts and then we spend two days where you actually um, build your uh, uh, execution process and you come out of that workshop with uh, a design for your board and um, who are going to be the stakeholders and a plan to, to get those five elements done. So uh, that's the end of the uh, commercials uh, and uh, if you've got questions um, I think um, just type them in there. We've got that. That was the end of my prepared part. So, Jennifer, do you have anything you want to say uh, on this? Yeah, thank you very much, Mark, for that.